Yeah. So anyway, what are you guys up to? I, I just want to, perhaps we should sort of like, you know, say who you are for, for people and, uh, and do a kind of introduction. So we have Owen and, and, and Philip here um, who, are, who are creating different kind of events and um, under a sort of uh, a label called the Dark, dark Renaissance. Um, and I think this relates to what we were talking about in a way, because I think, I think this notion of the Dark Renaissance is kind of like, it's like Gavora coming in and saying, no, we, you know, we need to break up the, the structures right uh, that, that are that are too reified and 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 too too anal and too you know autistic and you know too too developmental does that make sense yeah yeah i think it yeah. makes sense and also like what we're doing the group that we just formed now uh, a few months back me uh, owen david and raven um with our Renaissance productions what we're interested in break, is breaking that boundary between digital and physical. So there's been a lot of discourse in digital for a couple of years now about dark renaissance, and now we want to break that into physical. So that's what we're doing and what we're interested in. How does that look like? Well, the first example of that will be in March in Gothenburg uh, when we're doing a two-day event. So, uh, and I guess we'll get into that um, during this... Uh, yeah, I think we can give the background to that now because it came about, it was something that you and David, that's David Hogberg, you and David were working on that first, right? Yeah, so basically um, I'm working with a company in Gothenburg. That's a, it's a weird company. It's like a creators collective slash club slash weird factory, you know, fact, weird, uh, weirdness factory. And I wanted to bring this, the philosophical thoughts and our discourses from online into physical and to Gothenburg. So originally, uh, that was the idea, to do a, a philosophy event in Gothenburg and bringing speakers from our networks and all that uh, to Gothenburg, to this club, and have a, a rowdier sort of philosophy conference. But then, of course, you know, everyone involved there is an artist. So then we started thinking, what about the art? You know, we got to do the art as well, because we've been talking about art and especially dark Renaissance art for two years now. But there hasn't been much uh, manifestation of that, really. So that's the aim to do that, really, to have an event that is both mind and body, basically, and intellect and art and have them, you know, blend together. So we're not going to do a dry philosophy symposium. Uh, it will be quite, quite a lot wilder than that. And then the art event will not just be like a gallery event or something like that, but something hopefully more alive and a bit well, dark. Well, that sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was, we were, we were, I was at, the, um, at the Emerge Festival in Ukraine in 2019, and, and they were talking about metamodernist art. And I was like, and they, want, they wanted to give us a demonstration of it. And it was this band and they did just kind of wacky avant-garde shit. And I was like, well, it's kind of interesting, but it's like, what is this? Like, so, so it's like, that's just what, maybe that's, that's a good question to ask. Like, what is it? Like, what is the, the nature of like dark Renaissance art, if that's what you're gonna call it? Like you guys both come from the heavy metal world, right? So, so uh, like you're both in heavy metal bands before, and uh, and uh, so I, I wonder, um, just of this notion of you know the need for that kind of dark aspect. Yeah, I, mean, I, I maybe riff on that. I think the first answer to that is that it is as yet somewhat undefined. Dark Renaissance is a lot of conversations and thinking that have been happening, like Philip said, in the online world. And now the point is, what happens when we start trying to make art out of them in physical space? Certainly, I feel that online world is very difficult to do creative collaborations with other than talking and stirring stuff up. But you can't jam together musically. You can't really do theater. You can't shoot a movie via Zoom. So there's a coming together in physical space that needs to happen to express the spirit of this thing, you might say. And I think we got first inklings of that when several of us were at the borderland in Sweden this summer. We had a big team and we bought a load of instruments and gear and everything. And we had some really cool, fun jams. 
uh, and they were jammed. They were chaotic. They were totally improvised. And for me, I think the sense is, all right, if we sculpt the context a bit better, if we create a bit more structure around it, then how are those energies, those inspirations potentially going to come into some quite interesting new forms of art? And then to kind of talk about the the metamodern point, or something that's been on my mind just the last week, actually, I've been thinking a lot about buto, the Japanese dance form. I've been talking to Alex Ebert about it as well. It's mm. really cool. Developed in the 1950s in Japan, which is interesting in itself, a total artistic reaction from the only country that's ever been fully nuked, right? And buto, if you watch it, it's this it looks like someone being possessed it's uh it's deconstructive a positive form you might say but at the same time it's not totally ironic it's not totally relativistic i would say it's not postmodern and so something like buto i'm paying a lot of attention to because it seems to offer an artistic way through what you might say the postmodern deconstruction of form but without lapsing into a flatland there's still something happening and this something that is happening is an expression of something very deep within the subject often very dark within the subject it's one writer about it alkistis dimech who i'm a big fan of she's written some great books on the occult with peter gray talking about it's a way to tap in a lot of the the primordial repressed material whether it's racial material or whether it's family-based material whether it's sexual material and give it an outlet stuff that just not only isn't spoken about in public discourse, but can't be spoken about. The shadows that actually can't be shun light on other than in movement and in artistic form. And certainly to me, that's where there's an interesting place to launch off from with this idea of a dark renaissance is how to connect the threads so we actually begin to have a lively artistic culture again, but without reaching back to, say, an aesthetic that's been done. For example, there's a bunch of people we know trying to reach back to, say, a Christian aesthetic by saying that ah, we've gone into modernism and we've lost the, the sense of spirit. We need to go back to spiritual art. And spiritual art means going back to a familiar religious aesthetic. I think we can actually begin to wind our way through with a type of uh, a spirit that is much more based on you might say the unconscious or the shadows or the darkness, hence the dark renaissance, I think. Okay, just let me, can I, can I jump in here? Because there's a question that's on my mind and, and I don't know how, how you would frame or answer it. But the point is, you know, all this talk about modernism, you mentioned, you don't even mentioned metamodernism. These are basically also justification systems, mm -hmm. right? And on, in, a, in a certain way, an artist really never is you know, concerned with those things, you know, because the just the historical justification or the framing, that's what other people do. You have, for example, in philosophy, you have the systematic philosophers, and then you have the historic philosophers. The systematic philosophers always come up with new stuff, but they don't frame it in a certain way or that so that it belongs to a certain period. The historians do that. They say, oh, no, Kant did this, and then Schelling did this, and Hegel did this. And so there's a trajectory. The, the systematic philosophers, they never do that, like, like Wittgenstein, for example. And so like David Bowie, for example, never would have said, well, maybe I'm a little bit modernist or postmodernist. That's not his concern. His concern is to maybe channel the collective subconscious be, to be in that very process. He's not concerned with irony or sincerity or all these kinds of justifications or historical systems you get what i'm saying and so like if you if you talk about dark renaissance that's already a concept right if you talk about meta modernism but i mean to be fresh art to produce fresh art don't you have to get rid of all these conceptual frameworks where you would locate yourself? I, I disagree slightly. I mean, if you look at, for example, Wagner, you look at Oscar Wilde, you look at T.S. Eliot, they all wrote extensively on criticism and their theories of art as well as their... I mean, Ro Wagner wrote several fucking books on his theories of art. Mm. And I do think... We're, one of the things we're facing at the moment is actually a crisis of criticism as well as a crisis of art. You can think of criticism as almost how society intergenerationally passes on the knowledge of how to think about art, 
how to make sense of art and ultimately how to train up artists. And I think this is where I will use that word postmodernism. The academy has been so overcome by postmodern criticism that everybody knew is thinking about art and what it is from this mindset. And I think there actually is a critical work to be done to lay out a new, perhaps, horizon. I think that's where, for example, although I give the metamodern crowd a lot of shit, at least they're trying to think something forwards. And I think that is commendable and interesting. I just don't think they've got the right angle on it. But so, no, I, I, it's true. Some artists will just directly tap into what you've called the collective subconscious or the imaginal plane or whatever. Some will also, I think, try and build up a critical text. Like Oscar Wilde's essay, The Artist as Critic, is important. He's basically saying it's a, it's a kind of fun dialogue between people. But the point is that these two things have to be in conversation with one another. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. I think but, but, the philosopher but, but, and the artist has to be kind of in a, in a dialogue. But, but the, maybe the problem... The problem is when, is when is not distinguishing those two things, right? I think we, I think it's I think a lot of artists you should we should read the artist what the artists have to say about their art, you know, like Van Gogh's biography and you know we should read the artist, not just the philosopher. But 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 the artist is always in conversation with the philosopher. That's how I see it. Sorry, Tom, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I, I was just you know thinking that you know I I don't think that while writing like the Dorian Gray book, you know, what's it called in English? Um, I think yeah, he was like... Dorian Gray. Gray. Yeah, Dorian Gray. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think that, you know, he, he was, you know, in a way stifling himself by, you know, putting his artistic work in a historical context. That's not how it works. I mean, if you're like growing older, then you put, then you get like a historical context of what you're doing. But while you are producing, you know, then, then it's kind of... Mm -hmm. You know, it's like to ask yourself where you stand culturally in that very moment when you create a music piece. That doesn't really make sense to me, you know? No, but maybe I can answer to this, Eric. I think the reason why we're using Dark Renaissance is because it is quite empty as of yet, you know? Uh, and it's not that big. And when we say Dark Renaissance Productions, that's basically us, you know, finding our band name from where we can create. It's not us... Right you know, initiating this new cultural era that will take over. That would be preposterous, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, so that rather, and we're, what, I, what I think is interesting is in this digital moment, it is a renaissance because all historical events, all historical artifacts, all art pieces are collapsing in this single moment and we're human bodies meeting machine intelligence. And that is a very interesting uh, artistic moment or an interesting moment to be an artist because it means that you have to work with remix and curation and context engineering and that is what we're doing and to just echo back on what what andrew said that both me and uh, owen come from the heavy metal scene i think for me the dark in dark renaissance is more important than the renaissance uh, because I, I was for I was in the Scandinavian black metal scene. You know, we did the shows with the pig's blood and everything, and w got into fights with both uh, extreme <laughs> right and left and whatever. You know, so like I did that. You know, I had a fantastic time, but it wasn't dark enough. You know, I had right. to move on because I, I I went into black metal looking for religion, and I found shit loads of stuff, but I didn't find religion. Um, oh, you didn't. So, you were looking for true darkness. Yeah, I you was. were just uh, you, you were looking. Yeah, you were finding some, some, you were like moving in some simulacra of darkness, but not the, you know, the, not the true religious darkness, you mean. Exactly, because the thing is, black metal was something that happened in the 80s and 90s. And every, every manifestation of black metal today is just reenactment of that. Right. You know, we're yeah. not, that, that culture is not like, I love it. You know, whenever Watain or Mayhem comes to town, I will go to the show and see it and enjoy it. But I'm not interested as an artist to work in that because it's it doesn't belong to our technological moment. I got a record deal by sending a cassette tape to a record label. You know, this is not even ten years ago. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so this right. is basically us yeah. like trying to affirm our technological moment and working with the human shadow, which is broadly speaking sex, violence, and intoxication. 
Right. It's interesting, and, like, um, sorry, I'll let you continue. Yeah. No, I'll just say, like, but Owen mentioned, for example, borderland here. So that is one way, you know, that internet culture manifests itself uh, physically, is co-creative model and participatory art, and also breaking the linear perspective. So, for example, when you go to see our cabaret, it won't be a cabaret that starts at 8 and finishes at 10 and has a lot of weird stuff in between, and then you have a drink and that's all separate. It will be like, you arrive at this space, and you will be profoundly confused for a couple of hours. And afterwards, you will probably think, what the fuck did I just witness? It felt like the internet. You know, that's what those are the sort of experiences we're looking to do. Hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about when you were talking, uh, Johnny Lydon from, you know, the Sex Pistols, and he did, they did a reunion and they called it, he said it was like a civil, civil war reenactment. Like, it's yeah. not the real thing, okay? And he knew it. Right, it's nothing is happening here but a but a reenactment, and I, I feel like a lot all, all these arts that are people like I feel so much. You see that you see this, which there's a way in which it's kind of natural because you have to learn the the genre, right? If you want to do country music, you know you you, you learn how to be a good country musician, but then you have to throw the fucking thing away and do something you know unique and original, and and that's like that's a risk because you do go into the darkness, don't you? Because you you don't know what you're really doing. And I think the most vital artists that the you know when they were in the mode of creation when Led Zeppelin were doing what they were doing they didn't really know what they were doing so much, you know, and maybe yeah. there's, so there's a way in which the, 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 the darkness is related to not really knowing what you're doing and allowing some chaos to enter the system and and uh, you know yeah and you got you got to be real you know to do that and Led Zeppelin is a very interesting example just to like um because you know you had jimmy page he's like dude he's got the tarot cards he bought the bold skin house and he's like reading all alistair crowley's book and everything you know but then you read uh, i think it's called as is nick kent he was a journalist from nme in the 70s he wrote a book called apathy for the devil uh, which is an autobiography of the, his life in the 70s but he said oh but john bonham he was the real darkness of Led Zeppelin. He wasn't into any of that occult stuff or anything, but he was like, the way he lived and everything, that was the darkness of Led Zeppelin. Mm, the so, drug, you know, yeah, that's the, the some, rhythm some too, you got to right? get real there. Wow. Yeah, the, I mean, his rhythm, like, just, I think that's what, I think there was real darkness in just the way he played the fucking drums, like... Yeah. There's just, there was just nothing like that, really. Uh, it's, it's kind you know, of Jimmy Page is just trying to keep up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. The interesting thing, I, I just remember that because I never thought about it ex explicitly, but when I was like 16, 17, I had like a phase, I think like one and a half years where I was listening to, to Slayer and Sepultura and all these, to all these bands. And there was a moment when I was like lying in bed and with my ear, uh, ear, um, headphones on and I was like listening to this music and going like in a deep like trance that I later only had in, in meditations and so that which is like counterintuitive if you, if you think about the music and you know it's it's heaviness and strongness but then to get into this deep calm state of i don't know what it was do you know that owen do you know that feeling where you can you know have these you I mean, know I think that's that's very often metalheads experiences yeah, of yeah, yeah. Metal going to extreme metal shows it's incredibly blissful and calming yeah i knew a guy who yeah. like he pl he played he played industrial noise music and he, he claimed that it helped his plants to grow, you know. Like there was like, it, and I noticed that the, the heavy metal guys are very tranquil. They're very calm. They're they're not like the, the the punk rock guys who are kind of nervous and neurotic. And mm. well, that's because punk rockers often their conflict is often external, and it's a conflict they cannot win. Mm. You know, it's a political conflict that, you nice. know, the punk rockers are not going to take over society. So it's just this eternal conflict that they will never solve. And metalheads are usually facing an internal conflict, you know. It's outsider, it being the outsider and all that. And that's also a conflict that most people aren't going to win, you know. Which is the religious thing that you're talking about in a way, right? Yeah. Because the, oh, yeah. the punk rockers are kind of just nihilist they're just smash the society whereas whereas the metalheads are on this re mythopoetic religious quest of some kind right totally. i mean you see at a metal festival people walking around with a t-shirt that says heavy metal is my religion and yeah. it's 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 true 
Yeah, and the thing is also with, you know, uh, to, um, like you said, Tom, you know, finding calmness in that noise, you know, usually right. how that works is that, you know, you hear Kiss when you're 10 years old, you just like, whoa, this is, a, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. They shoot rockets out of their guitars. And then you find the <laughs> calmness in that. And then you go look for the next thing and you find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then yeah, after yeah. that, you find Slayer. And then basically you do that until you're so calm and you come to noise music. And when you find calmness in that, you've sort of, you know, hit the ground floor there. <laughs> and then you, you have to do something else. And I guess in my case and in Owen's case, that was going into burner culture and, you know, rave culture and all that and doing the same thing over and over again. So in a way, you know, it, it does indeed start with a joint and then you end up, you know, yeah. further down the line, you know, it just yeah. gets worse. I remember I had all the cassettes. The first band I ever listened to, I had all the cassettes of Rush. You know this band? Oh, of course. And, yeah. and they're, they're so completely pyrotechnical in their playing they're the guy plays his drums like 360 degrees <laughs> and um um you know it, I, it's you know just that was like prepubescent and i was thinking the reason that rush was so cool to me at that time was was because there, there's it's like anti-sexuality or something there's no real sexuality in it it's all masculine sort of like pyrotechnics or something right yeah. Um, and then when you get to Led Zeppelin, there's the deep sexuality, which and blues, which which kind of mixes with that, just purely technical. Because I keep going back to Rush to see if I could enjoy it again, and I can't really because it's it's so technical. It doesn't have that deep, uh, you know. Uh, it doesn't have that like like the darkness that you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, okay. when you get when you get into the really dark stuff, sexuality is gone again, you know, because <laughs> yeah. it's only dudes in the woods, you know, playing tape recorders. So, <laughs> so, so regarding you know the the art event, so the the dark and the the spiritual religious that will be part also of the of 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 the program, or how would you how because you say you want to do like something in the real world, you know, apart from the online course and and the art, but now we're talking about darkness. And you know the spiritual religious aspect of 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 art. Mm. Let's say, is that something that you that you go for in that in that thing? Yes, and and other things too, because you know this is meant to be more like a, an entire spectrum. So it's it's perhaps better to think of it as a David Lynch movie than a Lars von Trier movie. Right. Uh, you know, going the full spectrum rather than staying in. Uh, the dark only the dark sides of it so there will be a lot of stuff and a lot of different vibes uh, to this and a lot of different forms of uh, art and artists um, can you walk us through a bit of that well I can't say too much now because we're 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 only just in it you know this is a mm. co-creative process and we're involving a lot of different creators doing different things some are more like doing and uh, working with the spaces the environment installations then we have dancers, musicians, poets, actors, painters, you know, all, all, all the, like, think of all the different people you would see at yeah, an early 20th century cabaret. Then we move them into Cyberdelia, you know, perhaps that, that will be uh, somewhat the description of how the art events is going to be. Mm -hmm. Very good. So it's sort of a, well, maybe it's a mentioning go ahead. the, the, the influence from the burner culture coming in, which is that Philip used the word co-creation, the sense of show up and bring what you've got. Mm. And I, so that is the idea for the Saturday. The word we've got is immersive gallery. So people are going to show up and perform what they've got, whether that will be musical pieces or dance pieces or theater pieces. And some of them will lean into the darkness, probably more than others. I think to go back to one of the things Philip said earlier, I think we're quite careful about not trying to be too prescriptive about what dark Renaissance means. I like that idea of saying it's a band name. It's an open signifier that already has a bit of tension within it because dark, because Renaissance sounds like one of the great points of culture and dark is of course, inversion, shadowy, painful curious and so all of that is the dream landscape the imaginal landscape orbiting this thing so we're almost going okay here's a thing here's the gallery let's see what comes out in it 
I'm going to do something. Philip's probably going to do something. Raven's going to do something. Other people are going to do things. Mm. But that's own. That's exactly what I mean. So you there there is uh, there's an openness. To, to hold it. You, you don't have, you know, a fixed structure that, you know, all fall, falls under, like metamodernism. It has to be like this. It's like there's a signifier, but it's relatively open. So exactly. new, that's what I mean. So new things can emerge and should emerge. Exactly. Yeah. But a huge yeah. amount of critical effort has gone into creating this signified. And at least four right. podcasts and Zoom meetings and books and conversations between everybody in the scene that we're part of has led right. Yeah, and the physical gatherings we have are really intense as well. When we're actually just trying to, you know, just the four of us in the group trying to, you know, set the frame, that's really intense. So, and of course, that goes into us inviting other co-creators, and we like we invite people who are interested in, you know, going the full spectrum. Who like who maybe wants to do comedy but also wants to relate that to the body and the the shadow side of that, and the, and people we invite invite other people like that. So we're we're building that you know slowly, um, and building a vibe. So and that's what I think is so fantastic about working this way that I didn't do for example in the black metal scene because in the black metal scene I did all these like grand rituals. It was the candles. Uh, we filled entire rooms with fog and, you know, we had blood everywhere and everything. That was like really, that was a really powerful experience for the audience participating. But I knew about everything, you know. I, I led that room, so I knew, I was never surprised, you know. I had strong experiences, but I was never surprised. Working with uh, co-creative methods, that ensures that I will be very surprised as well at what happens. So that's interesting for me. So... That's, those are the sort of artistic methods that I'm interested in nowadays. You know, when everyone involved, no one has the full picture and everyone will be surprised. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I, Andrew, may I, may I ask a, a quick follow-up question before you jump in? Mm -hmm. so, so because you mentioned, you, you mentioned ritual and you mentioned, you know, that you don't know really what will happen. We're talking about spirituality and religion. And so like the thing that I always come back to, it's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect yeah, of ritual. So the idea to implement new values, to implement new strategies, to implement new ways of perceiving and being in the world, you know? So is that something that will be part of that event? So, so the 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 ritual aspect of it so it's like to change not only the the field that you're in but being embedded in the whole culture to add something to to bring a certain vantage point to to the event so that's not just it's completely open what happens or what will happen there's also like an implicit goal in there somewhere is that something that you reflect upon or is that is that you know the 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 ritual aspect to it. Yeah. Yeah. You get yeah, what you, I'm saying? You know, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we conspire, you know, <laughs> no, right. but it's, um, it's um, of course, like what, what is special to this event that I haven't seen and, you know, that many other burner type events or co-creative events is that the first night we're doing philosophy and we will have a philosophy symposium. Then we will have speakers we have invited who have important stuff to say about machine intelligence and human bodies. And that will, of course, feed, uh, that, there will be a feedback into the next night because, you know, people attending that night will be affected by that. And we've chosen speakers who may not agree on everything and that come with certain different perspectives and who are certainly, you know, wild people <laughs> who will stir up some things. So that is, but that is like ultimately what we want to do is like we want to uh, affect this discourse about machine intelligence and human right. bodies and the, the spiritual religious aspect of that. Um, that, is, that is what we want to do, but we won't provide answers for that, you know. It, what, so I, I can say like what you won't see at, at our symposium is someone, you know, taking the stage and talking, you know, about are the robots gonna take our jobs now? And then you'll have six five-year-old examples of that and then one question and then it's over, you know, that won't happen. It will be way more interesting than that. Um, so, um, of course, we have an idea of how this 
event will influence people, but you know, we're not gonna, we're not doing propaganda. <laughs> yeah. When I was like in the cabaret scene in Montreal in the nineties, there was some dangerous shit going on, like that you couldn't do today. I feel like, um, because of the woke culture, uh, well, I'm wondering about this, like dynamic between how do you keep people safe and also do dangerous shit? Because you, in a way, you have to keep people safe when you create these ritual spaces and people have to be prepared to go into them. Like, um, you know, if you're if you're if you're if you're doing, you know, if you're doing actual religion and Tantra and stuff like that, there's a lot of preparation, you know, before you can go into these kind of spaces, there's there's a certain kind of training and preparation and then and then you're ready to enter sort of different kinds of spaces. So so, yeah, I'm just what about what about that? Like, what about the danger of the whole business? Yeah, you're, you're thinking about the membranics here, basically, for our event. Mm. Yeah, and this event is it's, it's a very important question because, you know, uh, relating to what I guess you were talking before about before me and Owen uh, got on the call about boundaries. You know, when you're doing dangerous stuff, you know, that is like the most important thing. Um, I have some experience of when boundaries have been broken and it became very dangerous, you know, so that is, and that can happen in very small events as well. Uh, but, and this is quite a small event. So, and people who get to know about this are from a certain circle. So there is some sort of selection process there already. And this is also located in a specific scene uh, in Gothenburg. Uh, so a lot of like, of course, we will have complete strangers showing up and participating. And that's sort of the risk that comes with this. And that's the excitement of it as well. But we are, this is a small thing now. And we're going we're gonna to keep it small until we can grow it. So we won't dilute the whole force of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, and of course, it's risky. Whenever you do these things, it's risky. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm thinking like in the 60s when they put, used to put acid in Kool-Aid and you know, people just, the whole culture going kind of crazy, which had its kind of effect, but I think we're in a new era now where we have to be care more careful with people's minds or um, or something. I mean, look, it's not a sex party and we're not planning to put acid in anybody's drinks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think what Philip is getting to, it is in the context of a particular scene, of a particular network, it's not like the 60s where we even have the technology to turn this into a mass cultural phenomenon in the space of a couple of years and then get every random party promoter doing a dark renaissance event in whatever city or town or state or wherever they are. Mm. I think it's going to stay quite small and low key and underground. And it seems like what the burner scene has managed to do in that if you know about it, you can get a ticket and show up, but there is a certain cost in getting there and being there and i think that's with this you're not going to see this event unless you're part of certain circles you're not even going to be attracted to that name unless or to the description unless you're of a certain inclination so hopefully that will provide some kind of filtering system then at the same time at the moment a lot of the people who we know we will be there i've got a high degree of trust in i think they're relatively mature and well developed and i've spent good time with them so i think there's a at the moment, there's a degree to which we can trust that the space will be able to hold itself. Of course, you never really know. And that's part of the fun as well. Part of the fun of the great Led Zeppelin concerts is that you have no fucking idea what's going to happen. You have no idea if Jimmy Page is about to overdose live on, live on stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you rarely see, like, I, I remember just having gone to maybe a handful of shows in my life where, you know, it's like, this, is, this feels really unsafe. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, but that also like, and that of course evokes the, this image in my mind of what I, I perceive what the 60s and the 70s were like, you know, yeah. and that is something that of course I have no idea, uh, you know, how it actually was, but you know, that we, I think we need some way to tap into that energy again, you know. Which sounds ridiculous when I'm saying it again because I've never been there. But the Dionysian know. energy, right? Yeah, there was, it's the Dionysian yeah. energy. I like I experienced a taste of that when I used to go to Grateful Dead concerts, which were all love and light. 
But it was really dangerous there because everybody was on acid. So it was it was crazy. And people would, you know, die. And it was like, it was, and it was a total anarchic kind of scene. And it had a lot of beauty to it as well. So it was, it had, even though it was all love and light, it had this dark element to it. This, you'd go there and you'd, you know, you'd go through this psychedelic experience with, you know, 100,000 people and you'd, people would hitchhike there and, Anyway, it was like another kind of world. The Dionysian aspect of the '60s, is the last place kind of where it where it still existed in America, and um, and uh, so so I yeah, it's like almost the lighty the lovey lighty stuff. I I was also thinking that the way the dark Renaissance, there's there's always an oscillation in culture between the lovey lighty stuff and then the dark stuff, and it goes back and forth, but. Within the dark stuff is a very like like we were saying about heavy metal guys being peace. There's a light, and within the the light stuff, there's there's an underbelly of of, of of darkness. I'm a little bit on the fence on this, Andrew, as you know. You know, mm -hmm. okay, because you know, I'm I'm I, I don't I don't know how to frame this properly, but you know, we we talked about you know the cults of Mithras and the uh, rites of Eloises, and so you have always you know the carnival of people with their kind of superficial religious religious spiritual practices, you know, happening in Greece, and then you have after the carnival is over, you have the true ritual, the cr true deep stuff in the catacombs below the earth, you know, also in the Mithras cults, or you have like, you know, all these kinds of religious things. And then you have the, the Hermetic orders, you know, Golden Dawn, whatever is it, where, where you have the, the true stuff happening, you know? And so I'm a little on the fence with, you know, you know, concerts and burning culture because it's also very superficial in a kind of sense. And, you know, it's like, okay, everybody can show what they got, but is it that what it's about? You know, is, isn't the, the true transformation happening in the cat catacombs where you perform, uh, you know, a variation of the rites of Elysis, you know? And, oh, what do you think of that? What's your... How do well, you actually, I think, Philip, I think Philip's thought this through brilliantly. We're talking about the Western Kung Mela Festival. Maybe you should talk about that, Philip. Hmm, yeah, so that is... Uh, well, I, I can just say, like, uh, Tom, I totally agree with you here. And doing this event, we're not inviting anyone into our private catacombs. You know, that's right. not happening. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's going on, maybe not. If you're not invited, you're not invited. You know, so this is, this is a public event. You know, we have to think about it like that. So there's, of course, an, there's an upper limit to the amount of transformative potential such a space can hold. And, you know, we're all aware of that. Uh, but uh, me and David Hugby, who's also in the uh, Dark Renaissance Productions, we wrote a paper about this thing, uh, precisely, you know, uh, the burner culture and spiritual development in communities, uh, part of uh, Kedda Last's uh, Nietzsche anthology, that philosophy portal anthology, is called The Digital Desert and the Burning Overman, where we talk about cyber culture and counterculture and, you know, how burner culture has affected uh, potential spin-offs now and I when I've been thinking more about that it's like the, and you're right the burn is can be very shallow you know sometimes when you're at at the burn you go into the deepest place you know imaginable <laughs> but a lot of it's really shallow and quite kitsch um, but um, the way I see it is like uh, I as soon as it appears as a hot girl on Instagram, then it's not deep, you know? Then no, no, like... yeah, yeah. And of course, like, I'm not talking about Burning Man specifically here, because, you know, Burning Man might be an influencer party with Mad Max theme now. I don't know. I haven't been there. I've been to other burns, you know, so uh, I'm not going to talk about Burning Man specifically. But, uh, yeah, so I think about these burns and these sorts of gatherings as a form of Western Kumela. And the Kumela is... Uh, a big festival of, with holy men in India, where all these different sects and groups of uh, religious groups gather. I think it's, it, de it, de it depends a bit, you know, on certain astrological factors when that is, but it's something like every fourth and eighth year. And they gather at, at a specific place in, uh, along the Ganges, and they have a ritual bath and, you know, have this gathering. And the thing is that they are, of course, not only existing as... Uh, groups when it is a Kumela, but they are doing their practices, you know, always. And then they gather and have this big festival. Uh, and that is, of course, something we got to investigate more, how the Kumela 
has functioned and has developed over the years because it's really old. It's centuries old. And it has served different functions as well throughout history. A lot of it has been diplomacy as far as I understand, you know, different groups gathering and, you know, ironing, ironing out their differences, you know, and maintaining peace and influencing each other. And that's, the, that's how I view these very big festivals as well. It's our different groups, our brotherhood, sister hoops, um, our, uh, our small cults gathering and then just being inspired by each other. Uh, but then, of course, you know, uh, we got to do that outside of that as well. And there's different degrees of authenticity, that, right? There's like yeah. always, always different degrees. The you know? difference between, you know, being doing a burn out in the forest or the desert or bringing that inner energy into the city, which is what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And that comes with certain advantages and certain risks, of course. Um, yeah. I, I mean, in my experience, the r really authentic movements are really small groups of people like tiny almost sometimes less than you know like four or five sometimes 20 or 100 but if you go more than that there's something gets watered down maybe if you, maybe it's the dunbar number i have no idea but there's a certain there's a certain if you go too big it, it, it's watered down if you're talking about like actual uh, you know spiritual if you're talking about the real thing um and then whatever what else what is going out in the culture could be very very big but uh but but it's still it's not exactly the real thing you know and even the big like gurus like osho i heard that osho had like 10 serious students and and a million followers you know so it's so it's like something like that like ripples right and different yeah. kind of concentric circles it's like the Beatles went and studied with the the Maharishi, whatever his name was, in the '60s, and then came back and transmitted a bunch of that through their music. A bunch of those guys in the '60s and '70s were really into the occult, tapping into it and kind of rippling it. But they were into the occult thing that was happening 50 years ago and stuff like the Golden Dawn. So it is this concentric circle effect. I think the other thing that's on my mind to go back to Tom's original question. One of my favorite passages in one of my favorite books, which is Dion Fortune's Mystical Kabbalah. Fucking amazing book on the Kabbalah. I one love that book too. Uh, that's random a random little paragraph where she says, what remains of the ancient religion in the West is in the church, the Masons and the cabaret. The church preserves the love of God. The Masons preserve the love of man and the cabaret preserves the love of women. Now, whatever you want to take with that, I find it super interesting that someone of the kind of depth and the stature of Dion Fortune is putting essentially the, the congregation, the small fraternity, the, the, the kind of cult and the performative cabaret as the three triads that you need to have a spiritual culture. Sounds beautiful. It sounds right to me. And it sounds really what we've been talking about in terms of the feminine, right? Uh, the fact that that the, the, the talk culture that were you know the, the the developmental theory culture you know all this thinking culture right is is hyper masculine and if that exists on its own it becomes quite sterile so you need the cabaret mm. uh you really need the cat we need the cabaret right now so so that's I, I think that's that that would balance this um imbalance right in the uh in, in the in the in the particular culture mm -hmm. and totally. the, yeah the 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 funny thing there is that our event is a two-day event and we do symposium and then cabaret mm. and what we found interesting here is that you know for example me owen and david we're longing for the cabaret because we're so much in philosophy but the people we find who are in cabaret are longing for philosophy <laughs> So right. there's this like right. that's that's been a nice effect to find when we're working with people here because it's like a lot of people who say it's just like the same the same spectacle over and over. We want something deep and to articulate these like I need concepts. You know that's something I I've heard people say like I need concepts and I'm I'm when I hear that it's like no no we don't like but, you know, <laughs> there's too many concepts. You know we because you long for the opposite of what you are like you that's that's the dynamic of eros is, is to long for something different than than you so so that makes total sense. Yeah, and that's like we found that the only way we could do this is to do both. You know, yeah. um, 
So, and that's also what we say with the Dark Renaissance productions. We do church, symposium, and cabaret. That's what we do. So what's the church? Oh, you will have to see. Oh, well, I'll see. Okay. <laughs> You're keeping that under wraps. We have, we have, we have a big church. Year church with a couple of old metalheads. That would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, also to say, like, my, my experience, like, to echo what you said, uh, Andrew, is, like, uh, the, when, when working with bands, what's going on in the rehearsal room is actually what the band is doing, you know? It's not the album, it's not the concert. What, what you're doing in the rehearsal album, you're trying to relate to each other and trying to create something and going through these like individual journeys of struggle, mm -hmm. which becomes a collective journey of struggle. That's the congregation and that's why you have a band. Yeah. And then the album and the concert, that is just a gift to the community. That makes and sense. If you, if, you, if you make a powerful journey together, then you will have a strong uh, or a beautiful gift to give as well. Uh, and that's why a lot of like all these bands we love and we're like fantastic can only do two or three records because, you know, you, you burn out. Yeah. Yeah. You just become a caricature of yourself at, at a certain point. And, and so you so that's you have to you have to have a way to dissolve the whole mandala or whatever the the whole cabaret and, and, and start anew in, in a total and pe that's one of the problems that when people are given sort of rewards right for their art mm -hmm. that's they're they're given this reward you know it's consumerist culture they get and they become icons of the culture then at that point they're they're they, they become sort of they become the, the civil war, war re reenactment they become caricatures of themselves like so, uh, or, so if you want to be a vital, things. how to be a vital artist throughout your whole entire life, not have it just a, I mean, you know, I'm an older guy than you, but so it's like, how do you, how do you do that when you're, when you're 50? How do you do that when you're 70? You know, how do you keep, how do you keep going? Um, I think what you have to do is you have to be able to, you have to be able to let go of your concepts, let go of your structures. You have to, you have to have a, a I think Alex Ebert calls it a death ritual of some kind. You have to kill the old thing to make room for the, for the new yeah i think i think the key is starting over and like if we just look to you know one of the absolute greatest artists in the 20th century david bowie you know that's what he did you know and david bowie is as far as i'm concerned one of the few artists who have completed the, the great alchemical work when it comes to art he has done a full life's work you know, he actually also planned his demise, you know, his end, yeah, you know, his death, the last yeah. record, the last record is this like perfect, um, this like, it, it is the perfect headstone, you know. Yeah. Next and it's an idea of a conscious after, death, yeah. right? Like, like yeah. having a conscious death is very, very, that's a religious you know, uh, that's a religious thing. Um, and, 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 and ritual, a conscious religious death, like, that, that's you know that i think you're right in that sense and, and how he ended it mm -hmm. and maybe you could say that johnny cash was doing something similar but he just kept on going and made you know headstone records after his death but you know that it is what it is but very very few artists get to do that uh yeah that's true you know, con there's constantly you know death and rebirth and then actually ending it uh, leonard cohen was also one that i think did that you know, yeah, I think so too. The album is just amazing. Yes, I think that the he he actually as an artist, unlike a lot of other artists, kind of got deeper as he as he as he progressed through his career. Um, often it's the other way around. There's a big explosion in the beginning of youth, and then and then there's a burnout, and uh, which is I guess I'm fine as well. You know, whatever is the particular, whatever the person's. Uh, whatever the person's soul i would say needs needs to needs to go through there's different types of artists and stages of growth and you know reminds me of that clip of camille paglia on an interview in the 90s where someone was talking to she's talking about rock is masculine and then the interviewer goes what about patty smith or what about this woman or that woman she goes mm. She had one great album, then she had a baby, then it's all flower power and power to the people. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, well, the phallic, the, you know, the thing of rock is just like, but, 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 but rock is also, 
you know, I, I think all these heavy metal guys, they have they have to embody the the they have to have long hair and wear heels and wear makeup and and so uh, so that's part of the spectacle is is like putting on the feminine and being so hyper masculine at the same time. Um, yeah, and then I the always like uh, yeah. Go ahead. A lot of the the big bands is then they just become ordinary bourgeois music people, and they, yeah. it's like you become Metallica wearing Gucci leather boots and ten thousand dollar leather coats and driving your kids to their uh, their pony stables and all of a sudden it's not very heavy metal anymore it's just ordinary upper class life <laughs> yeah well, that's why i always it loved you know the, the doors have you guys read um you know the white album from john didion you know where she describes you know like a rock session like a usual day with the doors it's super weird what happens you know it's like you find it on the internet you guys know what i'm talking about this book the I read this book. That's a great I book. Yeah. The doors, so I got I got to read. You should it. get that book. You know, there's like a section in there where she just talks about being an afternoon or like two afternoons with the doors, and it's like it's super weird. It's it's plays like '68 and six or '69, and there's so much going on there, like so much female dark you know weird energy, death and rebirth, and everything is weird, and nobody nobody le ever leaves the room because the whole culture is in that room and the way she describes it and the darkness you now i always felt a kinship between you know these kinds of energies and and heavy metal and all these kinds of things that really grab you by the the yeah well the the balls in kind of way you know the soul whatever you want to call it it's amazing it's it's great mm -hmm. Yeah, you were mentioning that, like, uh, Paglia, and I remember Paglia saying that her generation got to experience the Dionysian. And, and that's kind of, it would appear that we're living in the Dionysian all the time right now because we have all this, you know, stimuli and, you know, and uh, constant. But it's not really the Dionysian because it's, it's, it's a substitute for it in, in a way, it seems to me. Hmm? It's just a mess. Yeah, it's it's a mess, but it's uh, but it's but it's it's a it's a pseudo arrows, it's a pseudo Dionysian all the time, and and it's 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 kind of a nostalgia for the Dionysian, but it's not really the Dionysian. It's kind yeah, of you know, I think now, right? It's like there's a Dionysian energy that happened, and then yeah. it's kind of it's like a cup of tea that's slowly getting cold, and now it's pretty cold, but nobody's got the balls to put the kettle on again. <laughs> Something like right. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I actually think it's. It, it's important to think, you know, with Walter Benjamin's uh, Art in the Age of Reproduction is called in, in English. I've only read the essay in Swedish, so I don't know. But it's like it talks about uh, art just being reproduced and you get further and further away from the aura of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly. why we're doing physical events, because we can't do this online. Because that will just be, you know, then we'll be looking at how other people are doing that and how we're going to fit into TikTok and YouTube and whatever that format, you know. That's why we have a house now. We have a full house. And we're going to do interesting stuff in that house. And we're looking to create some sort of aura there. That people who are there will be affected. And we can't reproduce that any other way. And just say, like, I, I remember that when, when we've done this before, you know, Owen, like you said, during the infamous karaoke night at Borderland. Mm -hmm. I remember you, you said, it feels like the 60s. And I sort of didn't get what you were saying. So I just said, let's go <laughs> that's what we're gonna do now yeah i mean it reminds me of the point we made earlier about the culture of criticism as well i think the 60s came off the back there was a lot of thinking a lot of experimenting with how things could be different but the culture of criticism that we've now had for several decades is the most nihilistic resentful pathetic form of criticism which is that you know i mean we don't need to fucking go into woke but that's basically what it is and so that's why i think it's very hard to tap into this aura to put this kettle on for example because and someone could just oh no that's nasty that's different that creates differences between people that means like sex is nasty because some people are beautiful and some people are ugly and we can't have that but yeah yeah sorry that's true also there's cameras everywhere so you know, you, you, you're always accountable to, to, to your online persona and, and that, that's different. That's, that's, that we're in weird fucking territory. I think mm. it's like, you can't, you can't, it's hard to know what to make of it. Like what it is exactly. And, um, 
because yeah. because because how do you behave in this in this world like um where where you're being constantly where where where, where whatever you're putting out all these digital artifacts all the time and um and and then somebody is 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 you're getting instantaneous feedback from the global village mm. um very different than than the doors in a room somewhere with you know very different and that is the yeah. point of doing physical events right there's only so much that can be done online mm. yeah Never I mean, we're trying to uh, stretch that medium a little bit, Layman, uh, and we at Parallax, where we do like we try to do this comedy uh, thing in February with Alexander, and and so because it's like nobody knows if that will work, you know, online because normally it's a physical event, but the weirdness of it uh, might attribute to the whole thing, and so let's see how that goes. Um, because it's not just philosophy or just people. I mean, it's just people talking. But I mean, you all also have to stretch the, the the digital medium as well. You know. Yeah, yeah you have to constantly experiment. Like you just yeah. have to keep experimenting continually. I think. Yeah, so, I'm super curious how that's going to go because my my hunch is that comedy works because when people are in a space together, you laugh and you literally kind of pick up on each other's laughing. Yeah. And if the laughter is all coming through a speaker. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be funny. I'm definitely going to tune in. <laughs> but it's like, I, I'm actually going to try out my own comedy podcast very soon, but we're recording it live here at my house. With oh, some really? London, just because I can't imagine doing it over Zoom. Right. So how mm -hmm. will, uh, what is that supposed to be? Like, how is that supposed to go? Like, you, you, have, you invite people at your place, you record it, and then you put it online, or what's the idea? Oh, yeah, so at the moment, it's me and, uh, and Rob, who I live with here in London, who nobody knows. He's not been part of this online scene at all, but he's, uh, he's very, very funny. He's a proper old-school East London working-class electrician. Very smart, very funny, knows all the old comedy references. So we're going to call it Bloke Smokes and Jokes and just have a dirty conversation and see where it goes. It's not going to be particularly intellectual at all, but hopefully we're going to record it tomorrow and then get it out. And then we'll see whether sick. people hate it, whether it totally ruins my <laughs> reputation, or whether it's actually quite good. <laughs> it's not easy to be funny, really. That's the, that's the problem, you know? No, no, no. no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we're, we are in this era of just exploration and experiments now. Yeah. yeah. So I actually think like, We've been talking a lot about the 60s, but maybe we're more like in the 50s, you know, the beat generation. We're like at 1951 or something, you know. On the Road has just been released and now it's like... It's absolutely Wild West at the moment. That's great, yeah. you know, historically speaking. Yeah. It's absolutely Wild West. West. It's, it's amazing. You know, you can do stuff. The medium is still relatively new. You know, you can meet people that you never would have met otherwise. You know, get inspirations. That's that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's yeah, why that... I think it's perhaps more like the beat generation than the hippies right. because it has like this wild energy, but everyone is wearing suits. You know, it hasn't found its form yet, and everyone is just outright mad. Like everyone <laughs> is insane. But you know, trying to just like there's no form to you know place that in a specific cultural uh, event or something like that. You know, it's like. Woodstock hasn't happened yet, you know. Who, who like God knows what the fuck that will be in our time. You know? <laughs> yeah, but it's I, like it's it's more it's more on the road. It's just all these like weirdos just traveling in, in the fifties. It was the United States. Now we're global. So it's just like weird people flying all over the world, looking quite like civilized people. But then when you meet, you find out you're not, and it it's always gets interesting. So I think like that yeah. is what we're at. Where we're at now. That's been my experience, at least. Except like back then you would have, you know, William Burroughs and, and, and Jack Kerouac and, and Cassidy and all these. They would meet in, you know, Denver, you know, and then they drive to New York. And so they and then they go to San Francisco and mm. they do everything. And, and whereas whereas we have these very strange cosmopolitan existences where we're we're connected to all these people who are like us. But, um, you know, but, but, but we don't kind of, uh, well, I guess this is what you're, this is the problem you guys are, are, are trying to, try, trying to address. It's because incredible power of collectivity created by the internet, incredible power of creating, you know, 
uh, symbiotic minds or, or like-minded people getting together. And then if you're just stuck there and, and you don't move that into embodied reality, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like you, 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 you're still in the, in the flatland or something. You're still in the, the two dimensional dimensional world. Yeah, but that's actually what I'm seeing. And I see that desire in this network. Whenever I talk to people of, yeah. you know, actually we, we do have Jack K. Rax and Neil Cassidy's and William Burroughs people in this. Yeah, for sure, I don't think yeah. anyone's shot their wife yet, you know, but let's, it's, a, it's like, um, <laughs> Um, we have a lot of crazy creative people and we do meet up physically, you know, we do meet up in Bordeaux and Germany in Sweden, in the countryside in Sweden. And then we just go to the next place and who knows, give it a couple of years. Maybe we'll all be at the Kumela in India realizing we have no idea what we're doing. You know, that <laughs> might happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most probably. You know, the older we get, you know, the more we realize we have no fucking clue what's going on. So that's, that's that. <laughs> yeah. That was, a, that was a great experience for me going to India because I had studied, you know, Indian religion and everything, but it took like five minutes for me, like just getting off a plane and just being on a cab into Delhi, just realizing, oh, I have no idea what this is. Yeah. Yeah. That was exactly my experience too. The cab into Delhi, just got, what the fuck? <laughs> rapidly unlearn 21 years of education knowledge and cultural experience <laughs> yeah yeah it's yeah. fantastic you know i i just can't I, I just can't wait for you know this group's india trip that will happen you know somewhere down the line well yeah like i i've been obsessed with gurdjieff at the moment as, as you guys know and and uh in the beginning of his book Beelzebub, uh, um notes to his grandson he writes something like the purpose of this book is is to uh, you know ruthlessly destroy every single notion that you have about reality basically that that's what he want, would like to do remind me what you're saying about going to india <laughs> and uh and then in the second book you have to read this book three times you have to read it it's it's just the weirdest book you've ever read it's it's absolutely bizarre and it's written entirely for your unconscious mind so you don't really know what you're reading about especially when you read it the first time and then after you've read that book like 1200 pages you're supposed to read it a second time aloud and then you're supposed to after that you're supposed to understand it <laughs> like the third time you read it um uh so uh, so uh, gurdjieff was very interesting but but what you know what i what i get from you know just like so far is is just is exactly i think his purpose was was really like okay let's just you know uh let's let's just all 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 of them all of the way we look at reality the way we look at the world is completely dysfunctional at the moment <laughs> let's you know um you know first we have to we have to go to india and, and experience this completely liminal insane confusion and then once once we've deconstructed uh, we've tricked our ego to that extent then something you know interesting can can emerge mm. Maybe we can say the same for our events. You know, you have to experience it three times in order to understand it, but we will only host it once. So good luck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a Andrew, one, one time special offer deal. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, will, will you lead us out? Sure. Well, anyway, well, great to see you guys and, and to hear and to know that you're doing such, you know, um, experiment and creativity and, and, uh, and, and cool work. And uh, so where can, maybe you can tell, tell our listeners, you know, how, how they can, you know, uh, meet, meet you or, or find out about you or, you know, experience your Bard Absolute or, or whatever. Yeah. Do you want to say that on? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, so the event, which is in Gothenburg on the 1st and 2nd of March that we've been talking about, it's called More Than Machine, Less Than Human. You can find that on facebook if you search it in the bar um hopefully tom and andrew will put the link in the in the descriptions to this conversation as well, well we also have a new telegram group called dot renaissance hq no spaces so if you try and find that then you should be able to get in we're going to be posting updates and various things there um i think that covers it really yeah. yeah, perhaps we should add you to our Parallax networks. We have this kind of network thing, and and uh, if you guys want to come in, and we can we can just you know let people know what you're up to. Sure, I'd love yeah, to. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. And I hope I will see you guys there. You know. 
What's the date in August? No, March. No, March. March, March. Sorry, excuse me, March. Yeah, yeah. There might be another one in August. Yeah, might be another one in August. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Be some church in August. Who knows? <laughs> Love to come if, if I can do it, but I'm not sure. But no, yeah. we'll do Paris in August. Right, Parallax in August. Yeah, Parallax. <laughs> we have to do the Parallax live event. So these guys are kicking our butt. So that we, well, that's a, that's part of the hope, right? Is that we're going right? We're going to do a live event, which means everybody else needs to fucking pull the stick out their arm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. We're Definitely. struggling with that for years, so uh, I would be happy if you, um, you know, spearheaded, spearheaded going into the, the real world and force everybody to do the same, really. Yeah, so, exactly. And we don't need everyone to be a success. It can kind of be treated as, as like, just keep trying and then some of the live events are going to be dope. And that's all that's really yeah. to get the culture going. Yeah. yeah, we don't need to aim towards something, some perfect event we can just or at some point we do, a, we do a, like a joint thing you know Absolutely. where yeah. You know I mean? I oh yeah yeah because really the thing is like what, what i what i've learned here is that the the most important thing is that you find a date and you put that on the calendar and then you basically you, you briefly say what it's about you always find the need a date you know the dates are more um, the most important things you yeah know? so if people are excited they will come that was sexual innuendo a, so i don't know Tom's well, making a German decided. joke now, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> a date, get it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. No, that's great, Philip. Uh, you need to have a date. And Alex, get a date. Build the thing around it. Yeah, Tom, <laughs> I think Philip's right here. Well, you all come in and we'll do it in, in, in the forest in Fontainebleau. We'll sacrifice some... some some you know virgins and things some like dates that. yes yeah we'll sacrifice and, and the the dates. old house <laughs> we'll sacrifice some dates we can, actually i found gertchev's old house we can go there it's it's burnt it's almost like it's it's almost like a mansion you could do some very odd rituals in there and um yeah. anyway 